So what I can tell about Ibarra, I, I, I know Ibarra in person because she is an entrepreneur, social entrepreneur herself, and we've created together uh, four years ago uh, an incubator for social entrepreneurship here uh, at the Hebrew University together with the Student Union. Uh, and I guess the combination of uh, practical knowledge and, theor and theoretical knowledge, both at the Hebrew University and uh, Uganda, sorry, Rwanda, uh, is wonderful. Ibarra, the floor is all yours. Uh, the development field has been characterized 
um, identifying a project, choosing a solution, and implementing it without too much involving the local population that the project was actually aimed to benefit. And over the years, the development field, has, as some of us know, has come to the realization that participatory approaches, which are ones that really involve the local population in the decision-making processes, are not only more ethical, they're also much more uh, effective in development. Um, but from what I've seen uh, before joining Spark, uh, when I was volunteering in Malawi, and also from different case studies that I've seen uh, during uh, my studies in Global, this understanding um, of the participatory approaches is much more, uh, much more exists in the theoretical level, and it's very, very difficult to translate it into practical terms on the ground. And I think this really is the, the secret of, or the uniqueness of what Spark managed to do. Um, and Spark managed to build a very unique model that really flips the paradigm to be bottom up um, and puts the power in the community's hands. Uh, what Spark does, I'll describe it in very, very shortly. I won't go into all the details, um, but uh, I will mainly emphasize the principles of the model. Um, yeah. So, in short, uh, Spark staff consists mainly of local, um, of local staff members. Uh, they're local university graduates uh, who are trained very extensively to become community facilitators. Now, these community facilitators reach out to vulnerable, infrastructure-poor communities, um, and mainly villages, and engage them, engage them in a five-month project planning process. And they lead them through a very, very structured series of weekly meetings. Now, throughout this process, the community members identify a project. First of all, they set their own goal, their own goal of development. They identify a project and a challenge that they wish to address. And then they design, implement, and manage the project by themselves. Now, after the community develops a project proposal uh, that consists of a very detailed budget and a very strategic implementation plan, uh, the SPARC team, together with sector-specific uh, sector experts, reviews the proposal and gives it back to them with feedback. And in turn, the community needs to integrate this feedback and revise the proposal, and only when they finalize it, uh, SPARC gives them a one-time micro-grant of up to $10,000 US dollars to implement their project. Now, SPARC doesn't, doesn't end their involvement here. Um, they keep providing six months of, uh, f of management support and another two years of follow-up support. And since 2010, when Spark was, was founded, they've been doing this process with 74 communities in Rwanda and Uganda. Now they've expanded to Burundi. And um, all of these communities have implemented projects, very, very, very different projects. And you can see in the diagram here, uh, the different types of projects that communities have chosen. Th these are things that communities have chosen from the very beginning to the very end. It can be in education, uh, building nursery schools or primary schools. It can be animal rearing projects, different businesses, sanitation projects, like building latrines, for example, uh, agriculture projects, health projects, electricity. Um, so all of these different projects are ones that the community chooses. Now, after presenting the Spark model uh, very shortly, I want to go back to the question of our panel about sustainability and ask if this well-structured process really manages to create sustainable solutions that have long-term impact. I mean, that's what we're talking about at the end. And I think that here the data speaks best for itself. 95% um, of the community projects that have been implemented with Spark are still running and serving their intended purposes. Now, this is pretty remarkable. Um, of course, Spark, I must say, had been active for a little over than three years. So this is information uh, that has been tracked for uh, at most two years or three years The communities have, have uh, implemented projects. But still, this is really impressive statistics that will continue to be followed up and it will be interesting to see what they lead to. And I think an even more significant fact is that over half of Spark's partner communities implement a second project without Spark. After Spark finishes their involvement, they keep implementing a different project, and this is based on the skills that they've learned throughout the Spark process. So from here, I want to elaborate on four main lessons that I find to be the most significant when looking at Spark as a case study. Uh, the first two lessons that we can learn from Spark's approach 
approach is that development, in order to be sustainable, needs to be both community-driven and locally-led. Now, by community-driven, I mean that the community is the one who, who drives the development in every stage of the way. Um, they decide, they have the choice about what they want their future to look like and how they're going to get there. And the SPARC model really manages to create community ownership and responsibility that's expressed in example, just I'll give you a, a couple examples, um, in the amount of time that the community members spend in the SPARC process, and the, the amount of money that they invest in this process to uh, implement their own projects. On average, each community spends 1,380 hours in this process and $1,716 on average, to implement their own projects. And also, on average, for every community meeting that's organized by the SPARC facilitator, the community organizes 1.2 meetings on average independently. They keep meeting at, uh, regardless of the facilitator. Now, by locally led, I mean two things. Uh, SPARC builds local leadership and enables local leaders to emerge on two levels, both on the communal level by empowering uh, uh, the community members to take leading roles, and on the staff level, uh, by enabling local university graduates to lead development processes in their own country, first of all by becoming community facilitators, and also taking management positions in the organization, like we see Consula here, um, she's the program manager of, of uh, Spark Rwanda, and together with her is a community leader that uh, emerged throughout the process. Uh, the third lesson that we can learn from Spark, and I remind you there are only four, I'm getting to, to the end. The third lesson that we can learn uh, concerns the way that, they, that the Spark managed to build the capacity of the, or, of the communities that they work with in such a manner that these skills stay with the communities even after Spark's involvement. Um, and I think Spark managed here to break down a very complex process of project planning, which is a process that's not trivial for any of us. And they really managed to break it down into small, very structured and easy to understand stages. And the process is very organized and systematic. The facilitators, the community facilitators, have a detailed facilitation manual that helps them to plan each weekly meeting. And the community receives very close and very professional guidance throughout the whole process. And I think that all of these together enable the community members to develop very strong leadership, advocacy, budgeting, management, decision-making skills that enable them to become their own agents of change. And what SPARM is actually doing is to teach the communities this professional language of development to enable them to be part of this field. And lastly, uh, the fourth and the last lesson has to do with the role of the, of the international community. And our role as foreigners, as foreign uh, development practitioners in the discourse about sustainable development. Because I think that if we all agree that in order for development to be sustainable, the main players, the key players, are supposed to be the communities and the local leaders, I think it poses the question as to where, where are we in all of this. And according to Spark's approach, the role of the international players is, is, is a double role. It's to provide support both through opening the doors to the international community, mainly to the donor community, and secondly, to really be there on the ground and help uh, guide the local staff. And to give an example of what I mean, as an intern, I didn't work directly with the local communities. That work is reserved only for the local community facilitators. I worked with the, with the local staff members to empower them and to increase their capacities. Um, so I think that to sum, to sum up uh, these four lessons, the fact that uh, the SPARC model is uh, very community-driven, it's locally <laughs> led, they really managed to uh, build a structured uh, process that builds the capacity of the communities, and to have that supporting role of the international players, I think that all of these are guiding, can serve as guiding pillars in many development endeavors. Um, and at the core, there are principles that can be adapted and scaled up in order to ensure sustainable development that will have long-lasting long impact in our world in many, many different fields. So, thank you very much. And, uh